Hi, um, I, I, my name's Catherine Lyon and I'm a, a retired nurse um, and in a, my previous life I was uh, the owner and manager of Stanley House Nursing Home in Herefordshire where we looked after mostly people with Huntington's disease uh, or long-term um, neurological problems. And one of the problems that we faced quite often and almost all, totally was the issue of anticipatory grief. Um, and so that's what I'm going to sort of try and help you with today. Um, so this is what the some of you may feel that the that the road of anticipatory grief looks like that, that this journey is it's very dark and very bleak and i will read a little passage out of um a, a book called finding meaning by david kessler and i'll refer to that a few times in this webinar but i just wanted to start with this line which says you don't have to experience grief but only you can avoid it only by avoiding love Love and grief are inextricably intertwined. And I think that's true. I think there's no way to pull one without the other. Um, so I'm going to quickly tell you what we're going to cover today. Um, and that is uh, what the term of anticipatory grief means. And some of you may already have done a lot of research on this. So I don't want to um, you know, teach you how to suck eggs, but it, it's probably worth just uh, spelling it out. Um, and what the characteristics of anticipatory, anticipatory grief is in particular. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the recognised stages of grief, because um, they're some of the terms that you'll be familiar with. Um, and then a little bit about what can help uh, to, to get through this period. And a little bit at the end about resilience, uh, which is something that we all need to develop in order to survive these um, ups and downs of life. So... What, uh, the term itself means it, that it, it's a name that's given to a tumultuous set of feelings and reactions that occur when someone you love is expected to die. And it, and it begins when they're given a terminal diagnosis, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease or a, a cancer diagnosis or any of the neurological conditions, Huntington's disease, MS, MND, and there are many, many others. And it particularly, anticipatory grief particularly refers to a lengthy a lengthy. Um, end of life diagnosis so you've got a, a long period of time to to um, to get through um, and you're preparing for that and there's many ups and downs so here we are uh, the, the, the the characteristics of what we would call normal grief the normal grief is what you would experience when someone has already died so you someone has died and you go into a state of shock or uh, uh, um, you'll feel numb, um, you're searching and you're yearning for answers and for meaning. Um, there's a lot of disorganization in your in yourself, in your thinking, you'll, you'll ruminate over um, sort of conversations that have been had of, of opportunities perhaps that you missed and you'll wonder if, if things would have, have been any different had you have acted differently. You'll feel like you're going mad because you're thinking and thinking and you can't get out of that loop of thought. Um, you'll feel angry, of course, uh, and fearful of, of, of what the future is going to look like now there's this big hole in your life. Um, you may, maybe you'll spend time neglecting yourself, um, you know, not, not getting out of bed or, or just sitting about the house, maybe not eating properly, not or drinking too much or smoking too much or any of the, um, the substances that we use to, to ameliorate some of our feelings. Um, and then there'll be a general disinterest in, in activities that you previously enjoyed. And then in normal grief, because the person has died, then this is, there's this opportunity to reorganize and, and regrow and start to move forward. <clears throat> in anticipatory grief, you're going to feel all these things. You know, you're going to be given your diagnosis and then you're going to move forward. You're going to feel shock. You're going to feel numbness. You're going to be searching and yearning for meaning. You're going to be disorganized and ruminate and go feel like you're going crazy and feel angry and fearful and neglect yourself personally over periods. Um, you're going to be disinterested. You may develop habits, drinking, smoking, substance issues to help you get through. But there is no end to it because you, you, you're not there yet. So you know this is coming and you're going to be fearful uh, of, of that event, that, that bit under the cloud at the end of the mountain there. You know it's on its way, but this road appears stuck in this whirlpool of all of those feelings. And that can be very, very distressing if you're stuck in that. So we feel like we're traveling in limbo, waiting for this 
this inevitable end that we know is coming and we don't know how for how long ago how long to, to wait or what's going to happen but you've got all this feeling of this life that you thought you, you were going to have is now not the life that you're going to have and and a lot of people will, will describe it as a big old dark roller coaster because there'll be highs and there'll be lows and when you're when you're in that your the highs and lows are more to do with the, the condition that you see a doctor you'll change medication there'll be ups and downs within the condition um and you'll start maybe you're starting to isolate and the highs can be oh my goodness you know recently we've had the uh, the the talk of treatment and cures for hd which have been wonderful and then it comes along covid where all of that research stopped or stalled and then that must have been a, such a drop for for you guys you know, with the hope of that suddenly happening and emerging last year and all the excitement about it. And then this great low of this year, which laid upon us another layer of fear and anxiety and having to get through COVID where we're all feeling particularly vulnerable and, and fearful and, and there's loads of information um, out there. Some of it's good stuff and some of it's not so good stuff. So be careful what you're reading and make sure it's well researched um, about the conditions and about those of people who are vulnerable and how they would be affected and that this this is the roller coaster of life for everyone but you layer onto that um Huntington's disease and you have a lot of big ups and downs and and, and challenges throughout that this roller coaster ride so we're on this ride and here we go so what can what can help us get through this okay so what can help you is asking for help here you are on this webinar looking at and finding out ways to cope um reaching out to friends and family and i i, I know having worked with lots of people with hd that a lot of friends and family might fall away but there will be friends and family who will have said to you if you need anything call me and they mean that and then the, with the bereavement work that i do a lot of people say i wish i'd reached out when they offered it because people will will also feel awkward and will want to pull away because they don't want you to be embarrassed. But reaching out for those people that you can rely on is really important. And it's very, very worth finding a good friend and saying, can I ring you once a week just to say hi? And if I don't ring you, will you ring me? Because it's important to have that support network there for you during this ride. Um, talking to other people. So there's LSVs, that's what I do, listening support volunteers. Counselors, um, doulas are, are um, a group of people who can help you to navigate end of life and get organised and get um, your, your affairs in order. And that can help give you an element of control, which we'll, we'll go on to a little bit later and ease out some of those fears that you might be feeling. Or you can employ supports, you know, get organised, get a carer in or get someone in to help you in the, your situation. You do not have to do this on your own. Advanced care planning, I popped that in there. I did a, call, uh, a webinar earlier this year on advanced care planning, um, and it can certainly help to calm down your fears. And we'll talk a little bit about fears in a while, uh, about the ambiguity of your situation, um, you know, what, what the person that you're looking after wants or doesn't want and how they want to proceed with their, with their condition. This is all part of anticipatory grief, is, is not knowing and not being sure about your future and their future and how that's to proceed. So have a little look maybe at the webinar I did earlier this year or talk to uh, your doctors or other people about advanced care planning, um, you know, and get get some of the documents and your affairs organised, uh, you know, a, a power of attorney, that's really important. Um, and some of the advanced care directives that are legally binding, very important thing to do. Um, also, so then what can help? Yes, ask for help. We've got that. Looking after yourself. And one of the things about looking after yourself is becoming informed and, and understanding. And here you are today taking a really good, brave step in, in becoming informed about the signs and symptoms of anticipatory grief. Um, and so there's here to explain that a little bit more to you, that there are some quite common stages of grief, first written by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in the 60s and uh, and they are there's some debate about them now as to whether they you know that, that there are other stages and indeed I'll talk about another one that, that I believe is there uh, but they're they're familiar phrases to you so we'll we'll talk about them one by one and um, 
and just uh, so, that, so that you can become familiar and be clear. What I will say is these stages don't go in any particular order. So you may feel them at any particular time and um, and that's okay. You know, you just know, know that they're there and understand that they're there and that will really help you on the journey. So the first of them is denial. And denial can look like avoidance of talking about the subject, procrastination, so putting stuff off and not getting around to completing your you know, advanced care plans or talking to a solicitor, uh, or things that, that, that need to be done. You're procrastinating about doing that because there's a little bit of a belief with denial that if I don't address it, it's not gonna happen. Well, you know, that that it, that's not gonna work, is it? So you, you, you need to sort of understand why you're procrastinating and have a look at it and see what it is. Uh, you're forgetting to do stuff that you become easily distracted there may be mindless behaviors that you that you are just reaching out to, to a different opportunity um, and that's because you're trying to avoid the situation that you're in maybe keeping busy all the time going you know, running around doing lots of different things that's a way of us keeping our minds off of a difficult or painful subject um, thinking or saying i'm fine everything's fine when anyone asks you how are you doing yeah it's fine i'm fine is that true? Are you are you being honest? And if your true, true good friends and family are saying how you're doing, maybe try saying something different. It's tough. I'm finding it hard. I need some help. Denial can feel like you're in shock or you're numb or you're confused. And indeed, it can feel like you're shutting down. So you're keeping everything to that very fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm busy. Christmas is coming. I'm going to get all this done. Everything's fine. And that sometimes is, is, is associated with denial. You're just keeping yourself very tightly controlled. And if you feel like that, understand that it's denial and you need to open up a little bit about that and maybe talk to somebody. The next one is anger. Um, and, and that can look like you're being very pessimistic about things, that you can't find any joy or happiness in the situation around you. You're cynical. You're sarcastic to your friends and family and or people when they talk to you. You're irritable um, and you can you can start to be aggressive or feel or be passive aggressive and, and, and want someone to care for you by by making them feel bad. It can feel like a frustration and impatience, a resentment of everything that's going on around you. You're embarrassed about the situation in which you're living and there's rage and and this consuming um, ferocity. And one of the things that I heard recently is that anger is the bodyguard of pain. And I really liked that because I thought, yeah, if you if you are feeling angry um, and acknowledge that anger and get a baseball bat and bash your bed with it as opposed to anyone else, or do something to help you manage your anger, go for a run, go for a walk, um, join a class, work it out, then you will expose the pain underneath, which is the sadness of the situation that, that you're, you're currently in. And if you can fight through the anger and understand what the anger is about, it will help you to deal with it. Bargaining is another uh, stage of grief and bargaining looks and feels like ruminating on the future or the past, worrying about what's gonna happen or wishing you'd done something differently keeping repeating or going over a conversation that was that somebody said to you that was unkind or or why did they say that to me or I'm getting upset about it but keeping it there keeping it in your head and fixed that's a rumination overthinking over worrying being sensitive to one little thing that that, that happened or, or didn't happen comparing your life to others comparing the situation that you're in to the to the person next to you or comparing the way that you're feeling this grief to the person next to you uh, can can be a challenge um, and, and, and can be upsetting predicting the future assuming the worst we can't know that but that's what bargain that the bargaining phase can look like thinking or saying i should have i shouldn't have um i wish i'd done this i wish i'd done that if only things were different a, a a strive for perfectionism, keeping everything perfect, keeping everything neat. If this is neat, everything is neat. And, and that's a belief, that's a bargaining belief. And a judgment towards yourself. I wish I was behaving differently. If I behave differently, then this might not be the way it is. But it is just the way it is. And it can feel like guilt. 
you can feel guilty. You can feel guilty because you're wishing that things were different and that you're angry at the person you're looking after or or, or caring for. Uh, because you're you're because you're feeling angry, you're feeling guilty. You can feel shame, and shame is a big problem in 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 grief because of things you hadn't said or hadn't done or wished had been different. And feeling ashamed of yourself serves you no purpose. So try and resolve or talk about that shame. Uh, blaming other people, blaming a situation. Maybe you didn't know this, this condition was, was in, in the family of the person that you loved and you're seeking for someone to blame and that serves you no purpose. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it gains you nothing. So try and knock it on the head. Fear, fear and anxiety. And I read um, a, a lovely book recently called Radical Acts of Love by Jamie Brown in which she... Uh, she was talking to a doctor who was dying and he had a load of fears in his head. And she said, you know, just maybe write those fears down. So I'm I'm um, advising you to do the same, really, because if you write the fears down, they might not be as big as you think they are. You might feel at the moment that there are a million fears in your head. But actually, if you write them down, there might not be that many. And if you write them down, uh, for example, how will I manage without that person? Um, what will the death look like? How will I tell the children? Uh, where are the insurance documents? I don't know how to manage the internet. You know, there might be lots of little fears in there that you could address, that you could deal with. Um, what would death look like, for example? I did a webinar earlier on this year on coping with loss, in which I talk about the trajectory of Huntington's disease and the way the illness changes and moves down to the dying phase and so if you're worrying about that it might be worth looking at something like, like my webinar or um, there are lots of information out there on what the stages are or how, how things change but it will help you to understand what's coming and what to expect um, and, and then you can, you can get your head around that and it can be a little kinder so if you write the list down of your fears See what you can knock out, see what you can get help with, see what you can talk about, see what you can deal with. And then some of those fears will be resolved and that's a will do you a lot of favours. And then there's insecurity in with bargaining. It can you can just feel insecure because you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, depression. Obviously, obviously, depression is is a real and, uh, you know, a, a visceral thing. The black dog, as a lot of my friends have called it in the past. Um, and. With depression comes sleep and appetite changes, reduced energy, reduced social interest, reduced motivation, crying a lot, and an increased alcohol or drug use because you're trying to soothe those feelings or find some relief from those depressing, crushing feelings. And it can feel like sadness, despair, helpfulness, helplessness, hopelessness, a disappointment in the general situation and a general feeling of being overwhelmed. And in normal grief, when you lose someone and you're grieving, that depression can just be a bit short lived, maybe, you know, a, a short period of time. And maybe there is no need for uh, an intervention by a GP because it's part of the process. But if you're in an anticipatory grief situation and depression isn't. Is, is stopping you from moving forward. If you're stuck in this, this uncomfortable, pain, painful feelings of bargaining and anxiety and anger, and, 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 and you know, if you're stuck in all of that, then maybe it's worth talking to your GP about, some, about something to help you with the depression. And sometimes antidepressants, I'm not a fan of them, but they are a bridge that will get you through. And so if, you, if you're feeling any of, these, any of these things, just talking to your GP or to someone can, can help you with that problem. OK, um, and then the, the last one is acceptance and oh, I'm gonna put on there. acceptance and acceptance. And in, 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 in anticipatory grief, sometimes you might get acceptance quite early on. You might go, OK, right. Yeah, we're here. And then the others will fall in later. And, and acceptance is really just um, being in a mindful situation, mindful behaviours within the within the within your relationship, engaging with the reality as it is, um, and saying this is how it is and this is how it is right now. Being present in the moment of which you're living, being able to be vulnerable, and finding a way to talk about things with people and 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 tolerate the emotions that you're feeling. Um, you you become you become more assertive, not defensive. 
um, and honest in your communication and you can be adaptive and you can cope and you can respond with some skill to the situation which you're, which you're living in. And it can feel like things are good enough. This is good enough. That you feel strong, that you feel courageous, that you feel you have some validity in the situation that which you're in. Some self-compassion, you're looking after yourself a little better. And some pride in how you're coping and, and you know, taking some comfort that you're doing the best you can and that you have a little bit of wisdom, that you know that giving in to to some of the anxieties that are there, that are sitting there by your side, giving into that won't help and won't serve you any, any, any good. Um, if we're not accepting, if, if you don't feel like you're, you're in, a, in an accepting situation, it's because you're fighting or you're avoiding the reality in which you're living. And I completely appreciate that it's difficult to maintain an acceptance when things feel so unacceptable. Um, and then there is a new stage which has come up and um, I talked earlier on about David Kessler's book, Finding Meaning, and he worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in the early days. So he, is, he has come up with, with meaning um, and we're going to go on a little bit to talk about meaning um, a little bit later on. So what can help then? We're going to quickly ping back through to remind ourselves. Um, asking for help, reaching out to people around you, looking after yourself, learning and understanding about grief and what you're feeling is normal. Um, and the stages and things and the emotions that you're feeling are part of that normal path. Um, becoming informed, as we talked about. Um, staying healthy, looking after yourself. Are you eating well? Are you keeping yourself nourished? Because if you're not nourished, and you're becoming to weaken, you can't look after that person that you love as well as you should. Um, getting out and about, exercise creates positive hormones. We know that it's been told to us a million times and therefore it's true. So get out, go for a walk, you know, do some exercise on, on the DVD or on the internet, just move about a bit and just to generate some positive hormones and try and get some good opportunities for sleep and this where is where you may need to employ someone and you know get them in overnight so you can go and stay at your friend's house and have a good night's sleep or someone to come in the day so you can get out and have a rest because restoring your own resources is essential in navigating this journey go back through this and again ask for help look after yourself and then green behavior green behavior is something that we used in the nursing in the nursing home that I ran, Sunny House, um, to bring a quality of life to the people that lived there. Um, and in anticipate, anticipate, the anticipatory grief, this the journey that you're on can look really, really bleak beca because of the things that make our life nice have fallen away. Um, and we, we may only be, you know, going out to see a doctor or getting someone in to come and help us. And those may be the only react, inter interactions that we have. In normal life, you know, grief-free, stress-free, we have a number of things that we do that keep ourselves positive and, um, and happy to reduce the stress in our lives. And they are uh, being part of a caring community, being helpful and productive and learning new things and a, a, a high qual higher quality of, of interaction. Being part of a caring community can look like, you know, having your family and friends around you. Um, maybe being a member of a church or, or fellowship group, um, uh, online support groups. Um, and um, uh, there's, there's a lot of them out there now. Social media has, has a lot of support. So, you know, even if you're stuck and you feel like you're isolated, there are other ways that you can reach out. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. Um, being helpful and learning new things for us in, in a normal life is, you know, keeping your house tidy looking after your garden, doing things that day to day that, that, that make you feel grounded in the life that you're living. Um, and that you can help, you know, the people that, that you're caring for can, can help in those things because it's important for them to feel and have green behaviour in their lives too. Um, reading the newspapers, staying up to date with current affairs, although I, my, my dad watches the news constantly at the moment because of COVID. So I would perhaps suggest not <laughs> watching the news constantly constantly because of COVID, but there's ways to, you know, stay up to date and, and stay current in your thinking, you know, positivity and, and keeping, the, getting the facts and keeping aware of what those facts are. Oh, it says my internet's unstable. I hope, hope I'm staying okay for you all. Um, uh, I put that in there as, as, as something to, to work on maybe with the person that you're looking after. 
creating a memory uh, or a scrapbook that's you know that that's being productive that's doing things which will carry you as a loved one through this journey and after you know after that person dies um keeping things and, rem and remembering things I'm, I'm working with a lady who um who lost her husband a, a year ago um and she's got a christmas card and for years they just had the same christmas card they sent to each other and they would write a line in it every year and she said it's actually she got it out to do her decorations and she said it was lovely to read back it's a bittersweet lovely and sad to read back and see the messages that he'd written to her over the years um and it was a great comfort it brought a lot of comfort to remember those times to which he was referring and I think that's a lovely thing to do now that he's gone she's able to look at that with with joy um and then high quality high quality is the stuff that is about feeling so touch of course is so important and I know uh, certainly with HD that can become a challenge um and uh, but holding somebody and touching them is such a wonderful sharing of, of experience that I cannot, um, you know, stress that enough. Another lady that I'm working with, her husband has leukemia and she messaged me, so what can I do, what can I do? And I said, you know, get on the bed and hold him and tell him how important he is and, you know, remind him of his successes in life because that's, when it comes to the end of, you know, and we're, we're on a, a journey where our life is completely different. It's important to remind ourselves of how far and how wonderfully we've come and how we got here uh, music more wonderful you know elevator of mood um, so get as much of that in as you can um, art and literature these are the high quality things which which make us um, and give us purpose and meaning in our lives um, and food again I, I appreciate with HD sometimes enjoyment of food can deteriorate over time but certainly at Stanley House you know we, we were blending up Mars bars and and putting Bailey's into jelly and enjoying the taste and the texture of food, you know, and think about how, how that can be brought into it. But for you, in your journey, looking after yourself, um, these all of these things remain current for you too. So we'll just to go back again, what can help? Asking for help, looking after yourself, green behaviour, and then now we're going to look about meaning. And meaning is the sixth stage of grief. And finding meaning is a little bit more than acceptance. It's it's about traumatic growth and and it's about considering what this experience, this journey that you're on means so that um, you can find comfort in the long run that it has a meaning. Um, and meaning, can, it, it, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be a small thing. I'll go through that in a minute. But I just want to talk a little bit about this guy, Stephen Sutton. And he um, he had, uh, was diagnosed with cancer when he was 15. And he decided to create a Facebook page, uh, Stephen's Story. So he took this scary experience that he was suddenly thrust into and decided for him um, to create this meaningful page. Um, and there are guys in our community that are doing a similar thing. Um, James Lake has a, a, a Facebook page, Fighting for Hope and Dignity, and he puts a lot of, of, of uh, posts on there and is, and is very supportive. And a lot of people reach out to that to that page. And I follow Matt Ward. Um, he's currently going through the Ross Generation um, HD1 trial, and he's put his journey on Facebook for other people to see and it's really inspiring and these are really brave and meaningful things to do in the the adverse situation of which they're in um, some of the patients that I had at Stanley House they uh, decided to, to donate their brain uh, to the HD trial you know and that gave them some meaning some purpose in helping to advance the, the the research and you know I would I love to think that maybe Jeff's brain or Steve's brain has was the brain in which they found some of these um, the, these these possible cures or possible treatments? I think that's a wonderful legacy. So there's ways that you can incorporate meaning into your experience. Um, and then I'm also a member on on Facebook of the Huntington's Disease Support Group, and that's on Facebook, and that's a global group. It's a big old group, and a lot of Americans on there, and um, and people from other countries, um, and they are really a lot of love, a lot of support, and a lot of people on there sharing their experiences. And, you know, sometimes reading the American stuff, wow, you know, they they struggle on top of HD because their healthcare is not free. And I can't imagine how that 
looks in in you know with certainly with HD how 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 they manage that that must be a really scary thing. However, we got back let's stay on with Stephen. So Stephen used to post pictures of his progress and his situation and what was going on with him, and he did that regularly. Eventually, though, you know, sadly, um, uh, he 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 started to understand that he wanted to um, utilize as many short term experiences as he could because he understood that his that there was no cure for what he had and he was he was in fact going to die um and what he therefore his meaning changed into trying to improve the lives of others by raising awareness of teenage cancer and fundraising and eventually he died um in may 2014 age 19 but before he died he'd raised three million pounds that's a that gave that must have been a wonderful thing for him to realize at his death that he had made such an impact that his life had that level of meaning um, and then two years after his death the total had risen to five million pounds but more importantly for his family moving forward the meaning was profound because he was posthumously given an MBE and so his mum could take that experience as dreadful and as terrible as it was and acknowledge that there had been this, this meaning for Stephen and for them, for she, she had pride, which I remember is part of acceptance, acceptance a pride in, the, in what happened and an understanding of, of how um, the, the meaning that came out of it. Um, Cecily Saunders, who was the founder of the hospice movement, made a very brave, uh, correct statement, which is how you die remains in the memory of those who live on and the anticipation participatory grief journey should include an understanding of the efforts it's taking for you who are going to live on to survive it with love okay so meaning doesn't have to be I'm just going to go back to David's book whatever the meaning is it uh, will come from finding your, your meaning may come from finding rituals that commemorate your that your loved one's life or by offering some kind of contribution that will honor that person or the loss of the loved one may cause you to deepen your connection with those who live up who, who are still here with you or invite back people into your life in which you've lost or it just may give you a, a heightened sense of beauty in the life that we're all still living um, and so privileged to have as long as we remain on earth and I think that, that meaning doesn't have to be um, a, 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 as big as Stevens. It, it, it is relative to yourself and personal. It can. It takes time to find it, and and don't you know? Don't set, resolve to find some meaning in it and become obsessed with that. But it might just waft upon you. Um, I'm, I'm. I go to Slimming World, and there's this in the in the Christmas edition, the new magazine that's out now. There's a young man in there who sat with his father as he died and his father said to him son you need to lose weight because you don't want to have the life that I've had and he's gone on since his father died and lost you know something like 15 stone and it has turned his life around so the, the experience and the sadness of his father's death has has transformed his life and that is a wonderful meaning to take from that um it doesn't require your understanding you don't have to understand why why this has happened to you this doesn't you don't have to know about you know what why this person had got HD and their fam the rest of their family didn't. It doesn't have to be an understanding. It just has to be as it is. Um, and even if you do find a meaning, you won't feel that it's worth the cost. And that's OK, too. I was watching the um, the, uh, the documentary on the Bee Gees the other night and um, and Barry Gibb, who is now the remaining Bee Gee, he he has gone on since his brothers have died and continued with his career. And uh, I saw him on Glastonbury a couple of years ago, actually. And he said, even though he's continued to be successful, he would trade all that in to have them back. And I think that was quite a poignant thing, you know, to have his, all his brothers alive still and living that life, he, he would not want the, the success that he's continued to find. And that's um, an interesting thing. It, it, it's not worth the cost, but it's still good to have meaning. Um, and I want you to understand that your loss is not a test. It's not a lesson. It's not something you have to handle. It's not a gift or a blessing. Um, loss is what happens. We, and you'd, you'd have had losses before this and you you know there will be losses again but meaning is what you make happen out of it um only you can find your own meaning and meaningful connections will heal painful memories so if you can develop meaning and understanding and uh, it will help you to heal as as time goes on so ultimately meaning is not staying static 
not suffering, being stuck in a suffering state and not experiencing all those uncomfortable feelings of grief that we talked about earlier. Um, it's, it's a way of going, okay, I'm going to move forward now. And it means coming through finding a w- and finding a way to sustain your love for that person while you are moving forward with your life. So here we are on this road of anticipatory grief. And you're both here together in, at the beginning of this journey. And the temptation is to, persi- is to fixate on the end of it, uh, dreading it and fearing it. Um, but like any journey, in, in any journey that you don't want to go on and you don't want to take, if you populate that journey with pleasant moments and memorable times and joyful days and new experiences and learning new things and understanding and creating a new experience for yourself, reaching out and sharing with others, touching and being touched, finding joy in life's small pleasures and filling your journey with laughter it is a far it it will be far easier to bear and all of those memories will remain in the memory of the person who has to carry on on that journey without you or without the person that you love it's far better than this dark road that's traveled alone and in fear and dread populate it with lots of good things versus traveling alone in fear and dread. Resilience. Resilience is a capability to withstand adversity. So here we are in anticipatory grief with adversity all around us and a fear of it in the future. And it's a, it's a way in which we can recover and grow and learn from life's lessons. Resilience is about self-awareness it's about mindfulness, it's about self-care and positive relationships, and it's about purpose. Self-awareness is about who you are as a person, it's about your spirituality, and that doesn't necessarily refer to religion, it refers to what you believe in, if you believe in Gaia and, the, and karma, or, or uh, you know, in, in, in other religions, or, or you know, in, in other beliefs in life, um, it's an understanding of that and understanding and taking from that what it means to you. Uh, one of the ladies I'm working with currently, she's a Jehovah's Witness. And I said to her, how does your faith help you in, with the situation? And she said a lot, a lot, really. She said it gives me a, a grounding and an understanding of, of what and why we have to experience these things that we experience. Um, it's about your morals, your own personal morals and your personal meaning as to why you believe you're here, your personal belief and what you think is true and what you think is good. And spirituality makes us fundamentally human. Mindfulness is about being present in the situation in which you're in, not in worrying about the situation that you're in, but noticing it, noticing the quiet at this moment in time about the smile on your loved one's face, the fact they're sleeping peacefully. Noticing that, not they're sleeping peacefully, I hope it continues because I've got to get loads done. It's being a little bit more present in in the experience. Having no regrets, that's really hard, but finding a way to get around regret, having no fear. And, And eliminating fear comes maybe with writing the list I talked about earlier, but journaling, get emptying your head, writing it all down, if you, if you get into the habit of journaling every morning, write down, or actually before you go to bed, even better, write down everything that's in your head. And that can just be crap, 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 crap. <laughs> everything is rubbish. You can write it all down and it empties your head and stops some of that rumination that you get. Meditation. Now, I struggle with meditation, if I'm honest with you. I lie there, I lie there meditating and I think about my shopping list and all the things I've got to do. I find it really hard to do it. However, I do love cooking. And I do love walking my dog and I do love watching my birds in the garden on the bird feeder. So I've made them into my meditative experiences. I calm down. I love a good, big, big, difficult recipe. and I love making it work and listening to a talking book while I'm doing it. So find your thing that that calms your mind. If that's what meditation is. If, if the actual act of meditation and lying there with Deepak Chopra chanting in your ears doesn't work for you, then find another way. 
Being grateful. Um, I, I love a book called The Six Minute Journal, and that nudges you into gratitude. Um, it's something you can get on Amazon, and it's just a little daily. They ask you questions on what, tell me something good that's happened today. And when you're feeling really dark, finding that is really helpful, just nudging you forward and having a good and positive morning and night routine. And I know when my sister was grieving the loss of her, her partner who died suddenly from sepsis, she had to write down, get up, brush your teeth, brush your hair, you know, and sometimes it's just need, you need to remind yourself to stay focused on that. Um, and so that's, that's how you stay mindful. Self-care is about eating well, as we talked about before, hydrating, exercising, sleeping, treats. How are you, you on your journey of anticipatory grief, you as a carer, treating yourself? Are you putting everything into this caring situation and neglecting your own needs? Or are you going, you know what, I'm going out, I'm going to meet my friends for, for a walk and a coffee and a mince pie. How are you doing that? How are you treating yourself? Is it a bubble bath? Is it putting a face pack on? do them and make sure they happen and don't feel guilty about it. Uh, maintain your positive relationships. Who can you turn to? Um, I've put counselling down there, but you've got your friends. Um, I, oh, I, actually, I'll just take that back a second. Uh, counselling, and I will put down the, the Samaritans. My 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 mother-in-law's um, struggling because my father-in-law has d- dementia. And she has, a couple of times in the middle of the night, rang the Samaritans just because she she can't think of what else to do, you know, and she just needs somewhere to vent. So find a way, think of something that, you know, have your your ways of turning to people when you need them. And I think that says purpose, though it's hidden behind the, um, my, my picture at the moment. So purpose is, I put Stephen's story there, doesn't have to be that big, but finding your reason every single day, you know, getting up and doing stuff and writing Christmas cards or making some mince pies, a purpose each day will make sure that you end your day feeling like you've succeeded. Um, and then a life plan or a day-to-day plan is, is something that you need to incorporate into resilience. And having all of those things as a little toolkit, little resilience toolkit, how are you gonna be self-aware today? How are you gonna be mindful today? What are you gonna do for yourself to, to, to care for yourself? Who are you gonna to talk to ex- out of the care situation? And what is your plan? That will help you feel a little stronger a little stronger to can continue along this road. So in summary, if you're on this anticipatory grief road and you need to gird your loins to get there, <clears throat> I can't take it away. It's, it's going to happen. We know it's coming. That, that mountain is still there. But if you ask for help, if you look after yourself, if you understand what's going on and become informed of the, of the road and what's likely to happen, so you know it's, it's less fearful. If you stay healthy and look, focus on your own needs as well as the person you're looking after, um, incorporate some green behavior into your day so you, you find some, some, some co- community and learn and do something new and have some high quality activities, um, search for some meaning, find, uh, find what, what for you you are gonna do and learn from this and become resilient. Then this dark and bleak road it, may, it will inevitably still be there, but the view may be slightly better. That's it. <laughs>